Right, so we good with uh, shear flow there? Or so, just to kind of go over this one more time here, the, the shear formula is um, what? Tau, which is the shear stress, is V, which is the shear off the shear diagram, times Q, which is the first moment of area. And what that is is the, the area that would shear off and then uh, if it failed at the point you're analyzing times the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area okay and so that's q all right so there's an example of doing q there so if we're analyzing point one we look at the area below point one that's what would shear off we find that then we find the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area Okay, and then divided by I, which is the moment of inertia for the entire beam. For this one, it was just BH cubed over 12. And then T, which is the thickness of the beam, the distance across. Okay. Or the, I guess better said, maybe the thickness that would fail, you know, the, the line that would fail right there. There's the thickness. Okay, so that's the basic shear stress formula to find the shear at a given point. All right, and then the next step there is we're looking at shear flow. And what that is, is if you, uh, one example of it anyway, is if you have a beam that's connected by nails or screws or something where you have a discrete point where you're attaching things together, um, what you do then, uh, you can take Instead of VQ over IT, you can just do VQ over I. And that will tell you the shear buildup per uh, unit length in these connectors, screws or nails or whatever they happen to be. All right. So we went through and we found the shear flow and figured out the spacing on the nails for this situation here. So we looked at just one of these areas, found the shear off the shear diagram found the first moment of area for that piece right there. And then, um, then we uh, divided that by I for the beam, okay? So there's the Q part. So we're looking at that yellow area, looking at the distance from the neutral axis to its centroid, multiply them together, that's Q. Okay, so then we found VQ over I, that's F, the shear flow, and then we figured out what the spacing on the nail should be based on that uh, shear buildup per unit length. Okay. So we got any questions there so far? Okay. All right, now the last little bit that we'll do with shear is we're looking at what we call shear center. All right, and this is kind of, a, it's a phenomenon that's caused um, when you have an asymmetric beam. C-channel is probably the best example. And if it's loaded, even if it's loaded over the centroid, it will bend and warp, as is shown in the lower left-hand corner here of this slide that I'm showing. So this, this right here. So even if you load the, the beam in the normal place, which is over the centroid, it will bend and warp. And that can often be bad because it can throw things out of alignment, throw things out of square. So we like to avoid that, okay? So if I push down on this thing, even over the centroid, see what happens? You see that? That's not good, okay? Now, if it's like this and it's symmetrical, you know, in the X direction, it'll just come straight down. That's not a problem, usually. But, but this is, okay? So, so that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay? So the solution to that is to offset the load because what you're getting here is a moment buildup in this beam that's causing this twisting. You're getting kind of a torsion and it causes the beam to bend. So what you do is you offset the load to counteract that bending. And there's a way you can calculate what that distance should be. Okay. So let's have a look at that. Okay. And this is on the next page down the line, I think, in your book. 377. 377, thanks. All right. So now this gets a little bit uh, 
tricky. Um, so we we'll want to pay a little bit of attention to that. So the first thing to do is to kind of draw what we call that shear flow pattern in the cross section of the beam. So what's happening is there's a downward load. Like so. So we'll put that on this diagram here. Now just think of the other shears as kind of flowing into that. They're all kind of flowing down. So there's the shear pattern in that beam. That's what's applied. Now it'll react in the opposite direction, but that's the applied shear pattern. All right, so what we're going to do for this thing is we're going to find, uh, find some information out about this. Now that's the shear flow pattern. Now what that does is that causes a moment. If you look at that, you get a net torsion. In this case, it's counterclockwise. The reactive torsion will be clockwise, and that's actually what causes the beam to warp like it does. But what we're going to do, we're going to try and calculate the magnitude of that torsion. So we can calculate it about any point we want. So the normal place to calculate it is where we can do the least work, okay? And that'll be, let's say, right there, because if I take the moments about that point, I'll, those two will cancel out, and I'll be just left with one shear flow that I have to worry about, okay, right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by getting the shear flow on that lower flange, so VQ over I. Now, V is just off the shear diagram, so that's no big deal. Now, I is um, the moment of inertia of the whole beam about the neutral axis, and that runs through there. So, see, I can do that little trick we were doing yesterday again. I can treat this beam as a rectangle with a uh, piece cut out of it. And see, that is symmetrical in the Y direction, so I can do that. The test of this, of whether it'll work or not, is I'll just look at where the centroids are of the different pieces I'm going to calculate. For the whole rectangle, the centroid's there, and for that cutout rectangle, the centroid's just to the right, but they're both right on the neutral axis. So I can do this without having to do the uh, transfer axis term. So what I can do to get that, mo that moment of inertia of that beam is... Um, take BH cubed over 12 for the outside dimensions and then subtract off BH cubed over 12 for those cutout dimensions in green. Okay. And so then I can get that worked out. Okay. So are we doing okay with that? And let's see, if you want I sub X, why don't we just do a quick little quiz here. Assume I'm a better drawer than I am, and that these are uh, clean and right, you know, right angled and some kind of symmetrically created. Um, here are some beam cross sections. Let's see. Which ones could I use that trick for? Would it work on the left hand side for that I beam? And it work because if I look at where those centroids are, or they of the shapes that would be for the whole rectangle, this would be for the two cutouts. They're all right in a line, right at the neutral axis. Okay. The T beam, could I do it for? Hmm? Yeah, ain't gonna work. Okay, because I'm gonna have the centroid of the whole rectangle there. And I'm going to have the centroid for the cutouts down here. And I don't know where the neutral axis is for this thing. Probably up there. So nothing's lining up. Okay, So that doesn't work. I have to use a transfer axis term for that. How about this one? Yeah, that'll, that'll work, right? Because it's all nice and symmetrical. I've got two centroids. And that goes through. Okay, So just, just realize when you can use that trick and when you can't. It works for the two ex one, ones on the outside, but not for the TV in the middle. Okay. okay, now what we have here are shear buildups in this beam. The, the thing that we're going over here is that 
you know, when you're doing shear for a simple, like a bolt that you're just shearing off, you assume the shear is constant throughout the cross section, which makes it pretty simple. You just, for the shear, you just take the load over the area. But when you have these more complicated shapes that are bigger than just a bolt, you start getting shear variations across them. Okay, so that, that's what gets a little bit trickier. So what we're going to do here, we're going to look at the shear flowing through this beam. We're going to take moments about that point because two of those shear flows intersect there. We're going to find the torque that's caused by this lower one. And there's a shear distribution there. The shear is zero at the edge of the beam. It gets greater as you work in. Okay, the shear maximizes right in here at the centroid of the beam, and it minimizes there and becomes greater as you work your way in. So the shear varies. That's, that's kind of one of the things you got to remember about calculating these beam shears, is the shear varies depending on where you are in the beam. So if we want to calculate the shear force down in this lower flange, we have to count, account for that varying shear. And the way you do it is you use shear flow. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to find that Newtons per meter of shear working its way across the lower flange of the beam. And then we're going to take moments about this point right here to find the torsion, the torque that that creates. And we'll use that to figure out where the shear center of that beam is. Okay. So we're going to find F equals VQ over I for the lower flange of the C channel. And we're going to do it in kind of a variable sort of way. We're going to look at an X moving its way in. And as we go, we're going to find Q, or excuse me, I'm sorry, we're going to find Q and then F for a section of the beam as we work our way in. And the whole deal with this is the shear changes as you, as you move across that lower flange. Okay. All right. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to find the shear flow, and we're going to have to accumulate it. We're going to have to sum it up for that green section. Now, this is kind of an empirical approach here. Empirical meaning just based on observation, not real hardcore theory. What we're going to do here is we're going to have to differentiate between the flange and the web. So we're going to assume that the flange goes halfway into the web. So half of that distance will assign to the flange, half to the web if you're with me there, okay? I don't think the flange goes all the way across because we're also dealing with this web here. Basically, we've got the two of them essentially intersect. So I think the basic theory here is just to split the difference. So, you know, you could think of that as being the web, and then the flange, you could think of being this. And they have this place where they intersect here, so they give half of it to the flange. And I've never really read up on the theory of that assumption, but my guess is that's just a kind of, you know, that's the best estimate we can do. Okay. So that's going to extend 0.21 meters across from the right-hand side to the middle of the web. Okay. So we're going halfway into the web and calling that the flange. Okay. We're going to, so, and, and let's see, we have a thickness here of points of six centimeters, which is 0 0.06 meters. We'll stay in meters. So this six here, that's the 0 0.06 that you see there. That's the depth of that flange on the bottom. We're going to work our way across it for a distance x. So that's where that X comes from. And then we're going to get 9 centimeters here. And that's the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that uh, flange there. Okay. So for any distance X, Q would be 0.06X times 0.09. And when you multiply that out, you get 0.0054X. All right, so there's an expression that gets this Q as we work our way across the flange. Okay, now the moment of inertia, you know, I, we went ahead and found it's 0.24 times 0.24 cubed over 12 minus 0.18 times 0.12 cubed over 12. It's 
0.00025060 meters to the 4. So that's our I value. So what we've got now is an expression for the shear flow. VQ over I. V is just comes off of the uh, shear diagram, and that's going to be a constant for any, any location you're at on the beam. There won't be anything variable about that. You'll just pull that value of shear off. Um, then your Q is 0.00054x. That's meters cubed. And then the I value is 0 0.0002506. So for any distance x, the shear flow is what v, whatever the shear is, that's applied to the beam there, times 21.55x when you work those numbers out. Okay. And then what we're going to do is take that number and add it up cumulatively as we work our way across. We want to find the total shear force in that lower flange from 0 to 0.21, okay? So we're just going to work our way across the lower leg. So I'm just going to integrate that. So I'm going to go from 0 to 0.21 of V times 21.55x dx. V is a constant for a given location on the beam, so I'll pull that out. And you know, that should be a lowercase f. That's that's what you use for, well, actually, we're summing it up, so maybe we'll leave it uppercase. It's, it's not a force, though. It's a shear flow. Okay. So we're going to integrate 21.55x dx. So that we're integrates out as 10.77x squared and times v, and then we'll evaluate that from 0 to 0 0.21 as we work our way across that lower flange. And what we end up with is 0 0.04752 times V. Okay. So that's the shear flow, the sum of the shear flow, I guess I should say. So that's a load in Newtons okay, as we work our way across. So we're taking a Newton per meter integrating it over a distance so we get a Newton. Okay. So we good with that? We got that? Okay. All right, so what we want to do then is we want to find the moment that that causes about point A there that we used. So we just have to find the moment arm. That's a horizontal shear force, so we want to multiply it by a vertical distance. A is right in the middle of that top flange. That's the average location to put it. So you're going to have 3, 12, and 3 more to get to this shear force. So that'll be 18 centimeters. Okay. So that'll be the moment arm. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take that uh, shear, the, the sum of the shear flow, the 0 0.4752 times V, multiply it by 0.18 meters, which is the moment arm, and that'll get us the moment that that causes about A, it's 0 0.08554 times V. And that's going to tell us how far to offset that load to balance it. Okay. So I just take that, and I want to balance that by where I place my load over here. Now the load is just V. That's kind of the cumulative shear at that point. The offset is called E. Eccentricity, I think, is what that stands for. So V times E is 0 0.08554 times V. So the eccentricity is 0 0.08554 meters. It's 8.55 centimeters. Okay. So that's basically how you calculate shear flow. And that gets you a way of preventing that warping when you load something over the centroid. You load it over this way, you can counterbalance that torque 
and the thing will just bend straight. That's what it will do. Okay. That's the idea. And so I think we were talking about those motor mounts on, I think they were Chevy trucks. If you look at the old ones, I don't think they use this style of frame anymore, but if you look at the old ones, they put motor mounts on them and they'll actually load the motor over here to balance out that warpage of the frame. Okay. Is somebody saying that they just sometimes they weld it and make it into a box? Is that what someone was telling me? Can't remember. But that would mitigate that too. That, okay. Oh, oh, under the motor, just run it across. Okay. All right. So that's called shear flow. Um, that's something I think you'll, some of you will see next year too. I've heard that from former students, which is why I put it in here because you'll see it again. I'm not sure if that's civils or mechanicals or maybe both. I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Now we got uh, one more major topic to cover if we're good with that. So that's all the shear stuff. The next thing here is deflection. Okay. Now this is something that we're concerned about too. Um, you know, you can only stand so much deflection in a beam. You don't want too much. It can. You know, if, you're, if you've got a frame for things that are moving and that and such, you can have interference when you have deflection. You can also get cracking in walls and plaster and that sort of thing if you've got it in the civil world too. So, you know, it's something you want to minimize. And there's certain uh, limits uh, for allowable deflection. So let's have a look at how to calculate that. Right, and when we were doing that bending stuff, we, we came up with the fact that kappa, which is 1 over the radius of curvature, is m over ei. Um, now from calculus, and I think differential equations, there's Euler's equation. Um, as I'm sure you all well know, 1 over rho, the curvature is the second derivative of y over x, divided by 1 plus the square of the first derivatives to the 3 halves power. We'll assume that's intuitively obvious, so we'll just kind of go with that. Okay, now for the small slopes like what we got on beams for structures and such, this, this slope ain't going to be much. If we square it, it'll get a lot less and then add it to 1. It's going to essentially go to 1. So for our purposes, that 1 over rho is essentially the second derivative of y over x. Okay. And that's kind of a, a nice little relationship that helps us build together this chain of things that we could look at regarding beams, okay? All right, so what we've got here is 1 over rho is the second derivative of y over, of y over x, but 1 over rho is m over ei. So the moment is ei times 1 over rho, which is ei times the second derivative of y with respect to x. So here we go. So what if um, if y is deflection, what's dy over dx then? What would that, how would that relate to the beam? If y is the deflection of the beam, what's dy over dx? Like what you learned in calculus, like 251? <laughs> yeah, slope. It's so a slope. Okay, what's the derivative of slope then? And when we get that second derivative in there and we add a term of EI, if we take the derivative of slope, what do we get? Moment. Now, if we take the derivative of moment, what do we get? Shear. Take the derivative of shear, what do we get? Load. Yeah, there you go. Okay. 
So there's a nice set of relationships that gets us from deflection to load. Now, the issue is that's what you do by taking derivatives. Um, now, unfortunately, we start with load usually. You know, we can get shear and moment equations. So we have to integrate to go the usual direction we want to go, all right? So if we take integrals, we go the other direction. We go from load to shear to moment to slope to deflection. Okay. So if you take derivatives, you can work your way from deflection down to load. If you take integrals, you can go from load all the way to deflection. Although from a more practical perspective, you can write up a moment equation. You can take two integrals and get to deflection. So that's how you can calculate deflection. You've got to know the material properties and the beam properties, E over I, or EI. Okay. All right, so just integral of load is shear, integral of shear is moment, integral of moment divided by EI is slope, and integral of slope is deflection. Okay. So this is probably the most fundamental way to find deflections. Finding deflections is fairly challenging for most cases. Well, it kind of depends what method you use, but you know, it involves a fair amount of work. What I've got here is kind of a chain of doing that uh, graphical integration like we do using that consistent set of rules to go from load to shear, shear to moment, and then continuing and going moment to slope and then slope to deflection. Okay, so I'm just using that consistent set of rules like what we developed. We just used them to go from load to shear and from shear to moment, but you could also apply it to go from moment to slope and then from slope to deflection. And I, I won't go through all the you know, details on this, but notice what happens here. If we use those rules, we start with a load like that, and we end up with a diagram like that, okay? just by applying those graphical integration rules. And if you think just from a common sense perspective, if you've got a beam with a simply supported beam with a load in the middle, what shape is it going to go into? It's going to bend down like that, right? You know, nothing fancy there, but see, that, that's what we come up with by applying those rules. So we can just integrate our way down, okay? Now, integration, unfortunately, derivatives are usually a little bit easier in integrals, aren't they? And um, so the problem with, with doing all these integrations is we pick up the need to have constants of integration. All right, so um, we need to have some knowledge of places where we have known values so we can come up with these things. So like a cantilever, delta A here at the wall would be zero, as would the slope. Okay, now the slope and the angle and radians for small slopes are pretty much equivalent. So, uh, you know, you can call that slope or angle, either one. It's usually designated theta A. That means the slope. Okay. Um, so, delta, so for a cantilever, delta A and the slope at A are both zero. For a simply supported beam, delta A and delta B are zero at the supports. You assume that. And also, generally, the uh, delta max occurs where theta is zero. Okay. Now, they use different symbols for these things. Um, I tend to do it a little bit different than most of the textbooks. So I'll call positive up, deflection is delta, slope is theta, and load is w. That's, those are the variables that I use. Some of the books use other variables. But I, I stick with those. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's 890. I've got a fairly simple uh, example of an integration problem. <laughs> and I'm being, uh, I'm kind of being a little bit sarcastic, but I'm being honest too. I mean, this is a simpler one, okay? And this is why this stuff's a little bit painful, okay? And it's like a five minute test question? Yeah, 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 maybe 10. But yeah, this thing. And, you know, I've kind of mentioned that. Take your time and, you know, don't drop negative signs. And, you know, this is why, I mean, and, you know, it, when you start working, it, it gets 
you know, the stakes go up and all that. So, you know, getting those good habits. But let's just have a look at this because some uh, somebody might have you doing this next year for sure. So let, let's just have a look. We'll start this. I don't think we'll finish it today, but we'll start it. So here's an example of how to do a deflection problem. And, and yeah, questions? Uh, were we supposed to go over the uh, homework due Friday today? Yeah, we were. Monday now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a good question. I'm sorry. I just I got to run around here. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that homework's due uh, Monday. And we'll go over it Friday. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Well, all right. So we'll cover that tomorrow. Very good. Um, Let's see. Okay. So um, delta C. So let's go ahead and find that. So our goal here is to figure out how much this point moves down when we apply that load to that cantilever beam. All right. We've got the material properties. E is 40 gigapascals. We've got the beam dimensions. So we can come up with I for the beam. Base times height cubed over 12. It's 0.00045. And then I went ahead and found the reactions. So RA up minus 40 kilonewtons per meter times two meters down. So RA is 80,000 newtons. And then sum of moments about A is the reactive moment at A uh, minus 40 kilonewtons per meter times two meters, which is the uh, distance it acts over. And then we've got the distance. Uh, to the centroid there, it's three plus half a two, that's four meters there, okay, for the moment arm. So the reactive moment is 320,000 Newton meters. So what we gotta do here is come up with uh, a moment equation. And I think we're going to do this twice, once from A to B, and then the next time from B to C, okay? So what I'm doing there, I'm making a cut anywhere between A and B. And I've got 320,000 Newton meters here for the reactive couple, and 80,000 Newtons pushing up, okay? Got a distance, an arbitrary distance of X going over, and then I've got the shear and moment at the, where I made the cut. So what we got there is 320,000 positive, 80,000 times x, because I'm going from the cut, that would be clockwise, so that's negative. And then that couple, MAB. So MAB then is 80,000 x minus 320,000. Okay. Okay, now what I want to do next is I've got that moment equation. I want to integrate it. That'll get me the slope equation. So if I integrate 80,000 x minus 320,000 dx, I'm going to put a 1 over ei out in front. They're constants, so I don't put them within the integral sign. So when I integrate that, I'll get 40,000 x squared minus 320,000 x plus a constant of C1, okay? So that first integral gets me an equation for the slope. Integrating a second time, I'll carry that one over EI through and integrate a second time, I'll get 13333x cubed minus 160,000x squared plus C1x plus C2, okay? And that's the delta equation. So I start with the moment equation, integrate once to get theta, integrate a second time to get delta. Okay. Now the issue is I pick up those constants, so I have to evaluate those. And so there you can see some of the work I'm doing to get those figured out. The constants are a large part of the work on these. Normally speaking, the integrals are just polynomial integrals. They're not that big of a deal, but the constants can be a little bit onerous to figure out what they are. So, um, okay. 
what you do to find those is you look at something you know. So I have this delta equation right here, 1 over EI, 13333x cubed minus 160,000x squared plus C1x plus C2 divided by, and I've got that 1 over EI in there. What I know is when x is 0, I'm right at the wall, so both delta and theta are 0 there. So what I can do is plug delta equals 0 in here, right there, so I'll get 0 equals, and I plug 0 in for x, so a lot of that stuff will 0 out. So when I do that, I get that C2 is just 0. Okay. So now I've got C2, and that's zeroed out. I can do the same thing here for, um, for the theta, the slope equation, and solve for C1, because I know that when uh, x is 0, theta is 0 also. Okay. So then I can do, I can plug 0 in for theta, 0 in for x, and solve for C1. C1 comes out to be 0 also. So that gets me nice clean equations there for theta and delta. Okay. Why don't I get you one of these to do for Wednesday? We'll cover that stuff uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thanks for reminding me of that. So um, what do we got here? We've got... Um, get you that uh, shear center fall. Three seventy two, I think it is. Yeah, so how about three seventy two? And that'll be due Wednesday. This is Thursday. That's June the 7th, I think.